Welcome to the Learning Shared Podcast. Hello, my name is Alan Wood and I'm your host. Thanks very much for listening. So Learning Shared is a space for anyone with an interest in supporting the needs of vulnerable learners in our society, including those with special educational needs and disabilities. We'll be hearing from and talking with a wide range of colleagues and stakeholders, including teachers, specialist practitioners, school leaders, researchers, as well as parents and carers. They'll be sharing creative, inspiring ideas, effective practice and things they've learned along their journey. With that in mind, please get in touch if you'd like to suggest a topic for a future episode or if you'd like to be involved in any way. You can visit us at www.learningshared.org or tweet us at underscore learning shared. The Learning Shared podcast is brought to you by Evidence for Learning and the EFL Send community. This is a growing community of teachers, practitioners, school leaders, researchers and academics that support children, young people and adults with special educational needs and disabilities or indeed any form of additional learning needs. You can find out more about the EFL Send community and Evidence for Learning at www.evidenceforlearning.net. I hope you enjoy this episode. Hello, in this episode we gain the school governor perspective to the recovery curriculum through a presentation and discussion with Polly McMeekin. Polly is Chair of Governors at Chattersley Corbett Endowed Primary School in Worcestershire. Um, If you're listening to the audio only version of this episode, we've put a link to a video of the presentation on the recovery curriculum website at www.org recoverycurriculum.org and if you select episode 11 you'll be able to watch and listen to the slideshow. Once again Professor Barry Carpenter introduces this episode's guest Polly McMeekin. Welcome to the next in the Recovery Curriculum podcast series. Today we have rather a special and unique feature where we're going to consider the governor perspective on a recovery curriculum. Governors are key to the strategic decision-making process of any school community, but the hustle and bustle of each day, and maybe in the context of lockdown, our dialogue with governors may not have been as rich as we would normally like it to be. That's not to say our governors don't care, and they're not thinking about their schools, and they're not giving vital support to the head teachers. It's been my very great pleasure to work in recent years with Polly McMeekin, who is Chair of Governors of Chadsey Corbett Endowed Primary School. Um, Polly has a long and distinguished career in education. She began her teaching career in mainstream science and then moved into the needs coordinator role. From there, probably having caught the special needs passion bug, Polly moved into being an executive head teacher, running her own schools, and eventually director of edu- education for a group of outstanding day special schools in the independent sector, both primary and secondary. And the focus particularly of that group of schools was those children with severe social, emotional, and mental health needs, certainly those children who have been falling into the vulnerable category we've heard so much about in recent weeks. And those children were the ones that often the state provision could not make adequate and appropriate provision. And so it was a real response to the very significant needs that those young people displayed. In 2012, Polly retired from that role, but she focused on her second love, which was cheesemaking. She has served diligently as chair of governors in Chadsey Corbett and Dad Primary School, Uh, and led it into a very successful phase in its development. So today, Polly has very kindly accepted our invitation to speak to us and to record this podcast. And she's designed the most wonderful PowerPoint that I would say even now, I hope each and every one of you listening will send to your governing body. Polly will speak to Strategies for Recovery, Compassionate Governance, and the COVID test. 
Welcome, Polly. Thank you, Barry. Um, that's really kind. As you said, I'm Chair of Governors. My school is a small one-form entry rural school in Worcestershire. I'm now retired from professional duties and governance offers me a, an often entertaining way to continue to help schools and families. I'm privileged to work with a highly skilled and compassionate team of 12 governors and a wonderfully patient clerk. I have, in the past, served as a parent governor for a complex needs school which hit a bad patch, a teacher union governor during strike action, and vice chair at a very difficult moment in a school's history. I have never experienced anything which comes close to the challenge that governors face today. So what can be governor's strategies for recovery? How can compassionate governance pass the COVID test and sustain our schools? Will it be the kindest schools that are the ones which truly recover? As governor at a voluntary aided school, and I feel that voluntary aided governors feel the, the current responsibilities acutely because they are the legal employers of worried staff. I've overseen rapid developments and an almost entire change of governor personnel over the last two years, whilst we work to acquire formal acknowledgement of our combined efforts to improve governance. It's been hard work, but well worth it. During our recent accreditation for the Effective School Governance Award, our assessor met with a group of pupils of varying ages and one question he asked them was, and what do governors do at your school? Well, I held my breath at that point, but a rather flamboyant year five lad replied, well, the governors, I suppose, and I waited for what was going to come because we hadn't prepared these children. We hadn't told them really anything up front. He said, they like the backbone of the school. They support all the parts of what happens here. I resisted the temptation to fist punch the air and shout, yes, get in there, you little beauty. But I did wish vehemently at that point to wrap him instantly in cotton wool and keep him safe in a box until Ofsted came. Seriously, I am forever grateful for his perspective and our governors have used it to guide their work ever since. We and school staff and leaders have worked ferociously hard, got the Ofsted grading we deserved, made some new appointments, and everything looks so set fair for significant steps forward this year. When COVID struck, it shook our whole community, and its challenge has required governors to demonstrate backbone, to ensure that our school and its staff and families survive and regain strength and confidence to move forward. The COVID earthquake moved our foundations and its ongoing aftershocks continue to test us. I, like everyone else, have drawn on my own life experiences as scientist and worker in the field of mental health to try to make sense of our situation. So you'll find this presentation littered with somewhat mixed references and analogies, I'm afraid. Governance rests on three core functions. Create the vision and set the strategic direction. Hold the head to account and balance the books. Although we at Chadsley Corbett have added the fourth, as suggested by the NGA, of a true partnership with families. These core functions are predicated on a shared understanding of what constitutes that which is strategic, i.e. governors, and that which is operational, i.e. not governors. As Nigel Gann in Improving School Governance says, being strategic is a state of mind. 
But the COVID test we face requires a new mindset from all of us who help schools to work well. I keep referring to the COVID test, and I suspect that in future at governor meetings, I may well see myself saying, you know, either openly or mentally, ah, yes, but does this decision of ours, would it pass the COVID test? At the start of the pandemic, our board was about to enter the developmental phase of our new strategic plan. We had our lovely away day all booked up, now scrapped, obviously. And I'd like to just say here, we were so grateful to Bromsgrove School for offering their wonderful hospitality suite to us for that meeting. And just to warn them that I will be back to make the same request soon. We were ready to look anew at the school's potential over the next three years. As chair, I was as worried by this pandemic as any of us. But when it became apparent that we were suddenly entering an entirely new context for schooling, we were able to look at our existing school values and realign these with our new challenges. If ever there was a demonstration of the wisdom of getting that core function right as governors, setting a proper vision, proper values, it has been the COVID test. When everything else is changing daily and everyone is fearful, a school community's fundamental values do not change and they provide the bedrock for the comfort, resilience, and hope that we all need. Governors need to be the compassionate drivers of these aims and values at all times because they make up our own backbone. In fact, they're the veritable vertebrae of it. I love an alliteration. So that was our first step to recovery focus on our values, and use what we know is good and right. I'm aware from commentary on social media governor forums, this is another new thing that I've come to terms with over this period, the Belmers chat, the primary school governor's Facebookery, I love it. Um, I'm aware that some boards are struggling to engage well at present. This is wholly understandable but wholly undesirable. Chris James in 2012 rather crisply pointed out that the lack of a capable governing body is a substantial disadvantage to a school. And this is not the time for governors to be absent in any way. We are a unique volunteer force and we only have to cast our minds over our recent social experiences to see how powerful volunteers can be when they adapt their roles to pressing human needs. Our advisors at the NGA and the DFE have issued much guidance, but it is a sometimes overwhelming wave of lengthy text focused on legal duties which can generate anxiety in itself at times. At the time I began talking with you, Barry, about the recovery curriculum for schools, it dawned on me that a governor board in such a situation might need to recover first. Governors, we must always remember, have themselves as individuals been seriously impacted by the pandemic, as every human has, and it could be useful if boards find themselves wondering about the role they can take right now and feeling a bit paralysed, to reflect on how a board might apply your recovery curriculum constructs to itself to recover its potency and regain its wholeness. And it might go like this. Begin by being open about board members' experiences and concerns If we don't do this, our internalised worries about this situation will slow things down. They'll interfere with our decision making, stop our progress just at the time 
when, as your son Matthew says, Barry, we all need to be on our toes. Use visual communication platforms for meetings like Zoom. Other ones are available, of course. So you can at least see each other. There's an eminent US uh, scientist and epidemiologist, Dr. Michael Osterholm, who eschews the term social distancing, preferring the accuracy of the term physical distancing, because we should never accept that we have to be socially distant. Acknowledge losses and anxieties. Many governors are retired grandparents like me. Some have been isolated from families or worse, have been shielding. Younger governors may have been homeschooling or lost identity via furloughing. Our ability to continue to contribute as governors is key to our own well-being. You could use the recovery curriculum's five levers for your thinking. Rebuild the board relationships anew. Are new roles needed at this time? Reflect on how the greatest anguish expressed under lockdown was the inability to see family. An implicit family model can be a very powerful tool in school leadership and board management. Reinforce the board as an integral part of the school community. Make sure that we have the skills on board to promote governor confidence, awareness and understanding of the thought processes. This is the metacognition bit. Seek new sources for support. We engaged with an ex-military member when looking at contingency planning for potentially challenging circumstances right at the start of the process because he knew about managing new normals. We also have formally flagged up with our local authority all our own struggles and asked them to share them because that's what they're there for. Engage in a realistic strategy plan for recovery and allow space and time to reboard. Once the board is in a steady state, then we can act quickly, flexibly, and with confidence and support others. I spoke to our head teachers yesterday about how they were feeling and what the board could do for them. Their immediate reply was, well, we obviously, we need support. Now, as we talked further, what support meant was governor understanding, good governor knowledge, to know the new situation for the school, to allow time for recovery. Just as the COVID curve was flattened um, as we worked with, you know, against the virus, we have to accept as governors that our improvement gradient may be shallower for a little while. At Chadsley, governors drew a graph about a year ago of school improvement over time, and it was not linear. It was a series of peaks, mini troughs and plateaus but with an overall upward trajectory. So we won't go demanding that schools jump back immediately to where they were before or bark at heads because things are not the same as they were. Because things are not the same as they were. One thing that came out of that conversation, which was interesting as well, was that our heads said, at present, they're so busy doing jobs around school that they are missing the strategic role that they normally play full time in driving the school forward. And that's a really interesting comment for governors to take on board. Governors are used to asking questions, and this is a time to ask some anew. We always ask, what do we want our school to be like? We may wish to think again about school 
as a place of sanctuary and as a place of readiness to face new challenges. I hear talk from some quarters about achieving closure in the post-pandemic period, and this is usually accompanied by references to unspecified new normals. And this sits uncomfortably with me. We have no evidence as yet that we will achieve any meaningful overall closure anytime soon. It's very possible that we will continue to struggle in this uncertain context for a significant period of time. What we do know is that we will get better at living and schooling in different ways, and that is to be celebrated. Governors also routinely ask, how do we want our school to be led? We may need to reconsider this in light of the current huge burdens on our leaders. Roles may need adapting or reinforcing to sustain the strong moral leadership we will need in the coming years. This may have resource implications. Oh, I hate that phrase when it comes up. At a time when none of us know what resources are to be made available to schools. Governors always ask, what do we want people to say about our school? Many of our usually looked for answers may come to be secondary to the one that we really want to hear. They were there when we needed them. Governors spend much time identifying what do we want our pupils to be like when they leave us? Maybe now is the time to think about adding our vehement wish that pupils will leave us with a well-embedded bank of clear personal strategies for coping with extreme challenge and a belief in and commitment to the unlimited power of community effort, to know that relationships can endure and function on different platforms. If it's hard for governors to confront these questions at this time, I always find a good starting point is to turn it on its head and ask, what do we not want our school to be like? Well, we don't want it closed or scourged by multiple exclusions or full of worn out staff. What sort of leadership don't we need? That which is self unaware, timid, wavering. What don't we want to hear about our school? That it failed our families when they needed it. What might our pupils be like? if we don't implement a good recovery curriculum for them. They may be untrusting of adults because they felt abandoned, overly anxious, angry, disengaged, helpless, hopeless. The government's decisions regarding schooling have placed a unique and enormous raft of operational decision-making on heads. And parents it is that face the consequences of these decisions. It's not wise for governors to stand back at this point and hide behind the operational strategic curtain. But when the operational threatens the strategic plans of governors, we must act, act to protect support, guide and care for our heads so that they have the confidence and strength to offer those same actions to their staff and families. As chair, I'm required to maintain a close working relationship with our co-heads. And yet again, the COVID test has shown the absolute necessity to cultivate unequivocal levels of trust in this regard. For who else should offer relief from the sometimes overwhelming feelings of responsibility at this time? Who else should share the crushing burden of formulating contingency plans for bereavements in their own school community? As governors, we knew immediately that school closure of indefinite length would have enormous emotional impact on children, families and staff. 
boards are required to ensure an adequate skill set to fulfil their duties. And we were fortunate to have significant mental health expertise in our number. We knew that our children and staff would return to us changed in many ways by their experiences and that some would have had their learning competencies compromised by trauma and that a recovery curriculum would be required to give all the time needed for processing and healing. This slide shows a little bit of the homeschooling that I myself have had to do uh, with my grandson, his mum is a nurse, and uh, I was okay on phonics, I could do that bit, but that cosmic yoga, wow, that foxed me. One thing that governors monitor closely is the school provision for vulnerable children. And we're used to checking on the previously defined groups of PPG, SEND and LAC children who were vulnerable to underachievement at school for many reasons. Our returning children will bring with them another vulnerability factor. And as governors, we need to understand the nature of this and be prepared to support the extension of provision for this newly vulnerable group. Are our staff ready for working in what could feel like a sea of heightened emotions and tensions? Are they aware of how unhappy children can project anxieties onto other children and to adults, which may leave confusion in their wake? What are the resource implications of these factors? Governors, before retreating into their established pre-COVID strategic mindset, might wish to consider how we will ensure that our school culture remains healthy and does not become a culture of fear and unhappiness. Our newly formed bubbles could literally burst. For as the old management adage goes, culture eats strategy for breakfast. So focusing wholly on our established school values, we joined with heads to tailor a strategic framework for recovery, which is now in operational implementation phase. It's a three-stage pathway of recovery curriculum for all, integrating times for reflection, activities to promote calm and processing of loss, as well as academic retrieval. A readjustment programme for some children who may find reintegration into school and learning very difficult, including those who may feel unable to return at all. And a healing highway for those children whose experiences have led to more profound impacts and thus may need some segregated provision to re-establish their potential for success. Some schools using your recovery curriculum, Barry, are creating museums of hope. We're using the happiness box plan and can envisage the basis eventually of an art installation that reflects how happiness can be found amidst difficulty and that hope for future happiness can be realised. This is our road to a renewed sense of safety and belonging in learning. Governors at our school are normally quite visible. We're in school frequently. We go every week to assemblies and offer surgeries for parents afterwards. We knew we needed to remain visible to staff and to parents and to children in this time of closure. So we've communicated in all sorts of often technologically challenging ways during closure. Letters and emails to staff and parents to acknowledge and empathise with difficulties, concerns and sadness. Social media posts to ensure that children receive birthday wishes from governors. Newsletter entries and direct offers of support and expressions of thanks from governors to families all helped keep our school community tight and functioning 
if not normally, then at least effective enough to ensure that children and families did not feel abandoned and that the most vulnerable were always at the forefront of our minds. As governors, we've been able to remotely monitor what has been provided by school as regards home learning activities and to gauge its support for school values. We didn't forget our volunteers. We wrote in our local parish magazine just to let them know how much we were missing them and how much we would need them very soon. Parent forums on the Zoom again were really important at the beginning of the closure period. Uh, I was invited to attend these by our head and to hear directly from parents and to see how we could respond. Our governor meetings have carried on remotely with some degree of success, I have to say, although I'm regularly reminded that it's not the same without the shared sandwiches and cakes beforehand. Certainly, this type of Zoom connection will most likely form an element of future meeting process, even when schools are returned to ordinary function. Agendas have been trimmed and policy reviews and amendments restricted to those required by current circumstances. How we will judge our contributions as governors this year lies, I think, in the same basket as how schools will report on their pupils in this summer to parents. Undoubtedly, we will reframe our criteria when looking at our own performance to judge how effective we have been in maintaining community cohesion and resilience. What an impact we have had on alleviating fear and giving hope. After all, school governance is about humans, not just the how much and the how many of things, but the how, and crucially, the who. And now we are, in part, returned, and the recovery curriculum is taking more shape, and it is clear that governors need to pay close attention to staff well-being. Just as children need time to process their experiences of lockdown and the strains it has brought, so staff will be returning, still processing their own issues. Small gifts from governors who are distant right now can help. We gave each member of staff a small tube of luxury hand cream to keep in their pockets on their return, just to let them know that we were thinking of them and the extra hand washing duties that they were following. Just to say hello and to let them know that they deserved to be cared for. Weekly publishing of data from school reassures and informs all community members that steps towards more normality are working well and safely. As chair, I communicate via Zoom regularly and I do visit the site weekly at a transition site at times so that staff, children and parents can at least see me smiling and hopefully reassuring those I see from a suitably distant spot. Fear will dominate our families for some time and any acts of kindness from any of us will bring balm and hope. The DfE tells us it's a governor's duty not to allow other issues to divert us from the ability to oversee and drive up the overall educational and financial performance of the school. The recovery curriculum will most certainly fulfil the first of these, as without it, we will face a decline in achievements, in emotional health and in the life chances of children. Whilst one cannot foresee the financial future of any school at present, its implementation relies not on expensive physical resources, but on the stamina, commitment, understanding and compassion of all of us who work with and care for schools 
and who provide the backbone of support that will lead us forward to that point where we can celebrate our survival and have those cakes and sandwiches together again. So what is this new governance going to look like in these as yet unconfirmed new normals that we talk about? When I first joined my board, the then chair told me that governance was like plotting the course for HMS school. I feel that the position of governance in schools now is akin to controlling a dynamic equilibrium, achieving a state of balance between continuing processes. As the impacts of the virus, government decisions and advice and the emotional health of stakeholders all fluctuate, governors will need to steady HMS school by making continuous, appropriate, and crucially kind adjustments. And we will need to use everything that we are learning right now. This kind of fluid governance will test us probably more often than we would wish over the coming years. But it is a time when schools need the strongest and most compassionate moral leadership from those in positions of trust. If we can get it right, the course we plot will get us to a destination where we have advanced new achievements for pupils, reached surprising levels of understanding, strengthened human bonds and secured learning. Needless to say, this is not the time for any of us to jump ship. Thank you. And thank you, Polly. That was peppered with so much insight, such rich wisdom poured out of that presentation. And for me, there was this constant thread of, of, of kindness coming through. Um, you mentioned it towards the end about compassion for all. Compassion is often talked about in terms of compassionate leadership. You took it in your title to compassionate governance, but I think you've shown how a whole school community, whatever your role and responsibilities, can show that compassion because ultimately, and again, you were spot on, this is about the life chances of our children. They must not be robbed of hope. Hope is the gift of childhood. And I think for many, particularly with the further extension of the absence from school for some children and, and, and the home-based learning, um, they're going to become extremely disorientated. Certainly, we cannot assume they will return as active, engaged learners. We're going to have to have that process of recovery in place. Uh, and I thought your point there about the, the state of balance um, and, and that dynamic equilibrium. And for me, it was at that point, I really got what the deep role of governors is now. Our head teachers are being bounced from one set of sticking tape to the next um, on their hands and knees, marking off areas. How can they think strategically they are into the intricacies of operational delivery, which again, shouldn't actually be their, their remit. So it is about, um, I thought the fact your head teacher had said to you, she was missing some of the strategic drive from governors. That state of balance is ultimately important. And yes, it's about moral leadership. Because I think, uh, and I know from conversations Alan and I have had with other schools and other head teachers, they want to go about putting in place a recovery curriculum, whatever it may look like in their school. And, and that's the purpose of what Matthew and I wrote for each school to make their own response. But they're worried that governors would drive them into the catch-up brigade. They would drive them into, but we've got standards. None of that can be achieved unless those children are prepared to learn again, have re-established, grown confident again in their potential to succeed as learners. And I think you gave us a unique perspective on that. We hear a lot from the head teacher voice and the teacher voice. We don't often get to hear from, from that governor voice. Um, so firstly, a huge thank you for, for that, Polly. Uh, I want to drill down a little bit on some of the things you've said by way of rounding up um, this, this conversation. What do you think, knowing your governing board as you do, 
and particularly because of the announcement this week on the extension for an, another three months for the, what is actually the majority of even your school population. I know you've got reception year one and year six in, but um, it would be still the majority of the school population. This week, what do you think the fears, the major fears of your governors are? Well, Barry, they are quite a few. Um, and, and that can cause boards to be a bit inactive at the moment. Uh, I spoke with uh, a colleague only yesterday. He suggested that he was finding two camps of governors, um, those which were looking at every way possible to get as many children back into school as they could, and those who were yet to really think along those lines. And another fear which has come out, uh, and I have heard, is the thought that governors have, you know, having signed off the return to school risk assessments, and it's in my view essential that governors do do this to share the head teacher's burden, that they may be held personally liable if anyone gets sick. Now, the NGA have said that if we work to guidelines and advice, remembering that the board holds collective responsibility for health and safety, we will be okay because employer liability claims for compensation against individuals are extremely uncommon and it would be very rare for individual governors to be held personally liable for health and safety issues. Mm -hmm. So a number of governors are feeling fearful and asking themselves whether they can endure the responsibilities that they feel that they have. But as I say, all of those responsibilities can be shared with local authorities, with trust boards, and with other agencies. We're not on our own. Thank you. I, I smiled, Polly, at one point in your presentation when you talked about early on in the pandemic uh, that your board sought advice from a former military member of the um, of the board. Um, tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, it, um, it wasn't that we felt that we were, as the media might have it, waging a war on the virus. Uh, so I really don't like that sort of thought at all. But when boards look around the table and just look upwards without any inkling about how to manage something, you have to look outside. And at the start of the closure, the spectre of potential deaths hung low over our thinking. And I had seen on TV uh, military leaders talking about uh, building hospitals and responding in emergencies and things. And I thought, right, well, okay, let's get a military perspective here. And it proved hugely useful. Um, we consulted uh, a local chap, Hugh Richards, to whom we are very grateful and who pointed out that applying our familiar standing operational procedures, the military call them SOPs, would give us the control that we needed to feel over very abnormal circumstances. His suggestion of contingency planning via a series of what ifs and his advice about how the military plan for death, invaluable. Once we used his advice, and created a contingency plan, we felt much stronger and we felt back in control. That sounds like it was good advice because that feeling out of control is something I think we've all experienced yes. at a personal level yeah. in all of this. Yes. And it's sound advice, again, for the situation you've had in the last two weeks with admitting some children back to school, mm -hmm. that for some of your staff with their own anxieties which are perfectly normal mm. let's let's be blunt about that mm. um they could at times feel out of control with the new dynamics all of which hinge around their children's safety yes um in a very significant way in a in your face way mm. we're all 
concerned with health and safety and safeguarding of our children in schools. But this has taken it to a whole new level, hasn't it, Polly? Yes. And um, it's very demanding, I think, on our teachers. They must be on their knees just with mental exhaustion at the end of the day, not just physical yes. exhaustion, yes. as we've all experienced yes. as classroom teachers. Uh, finally, can I say, you know, you've obviously worked on this presentation very much to the, to the final minute before this <laughs> recording. But thinking of your governing body and having to believe, because it's our human nature, that brighter days will come again, What's your visioning for the future as a governing body, do you think? Well, I think, you know, as governors tend to, you know, we, we retreat into the practicalities uh, and the things on the top of our minds are the kind of almost safe things to think about. You know, we're nearly at the end of the academic year. We're supposed to be doing all sorts of things. Some governor terms will expire. How will we find replacements? What staff vacancies uh, will we have? How can we fill them? Um, and the classic, you know, what on earth will be the resource implications of all of this? Um, so those are the things at the forefront of our mind. But for us, we are asking, what training do we need? And I think I can answer that one. All governors need to use this time to learn Governors need to understand more to be able to give appropriate support. We need to learn about how stress and trauma impacts on performance. And governors could do worse than looking at the EFL site this podcast is on, where there's a plethora of information to help them create their new normal school. One where their own first instinct really needs to be kindness. Thank you, Polly. Uh, again, that theme of kindness has come through. And kindness has been a thread throughout the podcast series. Uh, in fact, in the podcast I made for Mental Health Awareness Week for the Learning Shared um, website, I focused particularly on the research that Mental Health Foundation have done on kindness. You wouldn't think something like kindness could be researched. But the simple thing there was that smile that we give the passerby not only warms their heart, metaphorically, but actually, it's good for our well-being. So I think those acts of kindness will be about restoring our sense of well-being, restoring our self-image, whether it's as a teacher, as a pupil, or actually as a governor. Uh, a governor with a moral purpose, as you spoke of. And hopefully those simple acts of kindness will be the glue that will bond together once again our school communities. I wish you, your governing body, your school, and especially your children, great success in achieving that. Today, colleagues, we've heard from Polly McMeekin, the Chair of Governors at Chadsey Corbett Endowed Primary School. This was another podcast in the Recovery Curriculum series as part of the learning shared from Evidence for Learning. Thank you for listening, and goodbye. Thank you for listening. You can find more information about the Recovery Curriculum at www.recoverycurriculum.org. There's links to resources, reference materials, as well as uh, video slide decks. Barry Carpenter's webpage is www.barrycarpentereducation.com. And the homepage for the podcast is www.learningshared.org. You can email us at learningshared at theteachcloud.net or tweet us at underscore learningshared. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And please do get in touch with feedback if you'd like to either suggest a topic for a future episode or if you'd like to be involved in any way. Finally, you're welcome to join the conversation via one of our online communities of practice. We've got groups on Facebook and LinkedIn and details are on the Recovery Curriculum and Learning Shared web pages. You can search for Recovery Curriculum as a group inside Facebook. So for now, thanks again for listening. Stay safe and be well.